Hey everyone, welcome back to Control System Lectures. In this video, we'll go through another standard homework problem so you can see how you can apply many of the things you're learning into a single problem. Well, to be honest, this isn't really a standard homework problem. This is a question I received from a viewer asking to clarify a confusion he had while working on a homework problem. It's kind of an interesting question, and maybe several of you also had similar questions, so I figured I'd make a video on it. We'll set the problem up this way. We have two systems represented by block diagrams. The system on the left has block G in the forward path and H in the feedback path. The system on the right has just a feed forward block with transfer function G over 1 plus GH minus G. The left system can be called non-unity feedback since there's a transfer function in the feedback path. And the system on the right is unity feedback where unity basically refers to the one in the feedback path. The question is, both of these closed loop systems are equivalent they have the exact same closed loop transfer function, but they have different open loop transfer functions. So what is the actual open loop transfer function for this system? Say if you wanted to design a control system for it, which open loop transfer function do you use? Well, we'll answer this in three parts. The first part investigates the question, are these closed loop systems actually equivalent? The way we'll go about finding this out is with some block diagram algebra. Let's take the non-unity feedback system down from above, and what we want to do is rewrite this block diagram to fit into a unity feedback form. Since we don't know yet what the forward path transfer function will be, I'm just going to give the arbitrary designation R of S. From here we can write out the closed loop transfer functions for both systems. The system on the left has transfer function G over 1 plus GH, and the system on the right has transfer function R over 1 plus R. Now, how do we make sure that those two closed loop transfer functions are equivalent? We just set them equal to each other. Now we can answer the question, what is the value of R that makes this equation true? We can do a little basic algebraic equation manipulation to solve for it. We multiply both sides by one plus R and distribute. Then we collect the terms with R in them on the right side and factor out R. Finally, divide everything that R is multiplied by to get R equals G over 1 plus GH minus G, which is exactly what the problem stated in the first place. So these two closed loop systems are in fact equivalent. All right, now on to part two, where we'll answer what is the open loop transfer function and why is it even important? Both systems we drew for this problem are closed loop systems. That is, the input into the system is affected by the output of the system. This is a nice feedback loop. So to open that loop, essentially we want to stop that feedback. We cut the feedback line right before the summing junction. With that line cut, we can determine the resulting transfer function is simply just g times h, which is the open loop transfer function. If you send a signal in at the input, it's modified by g of s and h of s before it gets to the cut point, and we're done. No longer does it feed back through that closed loop system. Now the mechanics are easy, but why is opening the loop a thing that we do at all? For example, why don't we cut it at a different spot and have the open loop transfer function just be g? To answer that, we'll do a thought exercise where you have to imagine you're driving a car. And as I like to do in these types of problems, I'll set up the closed loop block diagram first, and then we can fill it in with information as we discuss it. The last block in our forward path represents the car's dynamics. Actuator inputs go into this block, basically commands that tell the car what to do. And the output is the performance of the car. You step on the gas, input, and the car accelerates, output. You rotate the steering wheel, input, and the car turns, output. So with that in mind, we can place the actuator information in the block before car dynamics. If you, a human, is driving this car, your arms and legs are part of the actuator. You move your arms, the steering wheel moves, and then the car moves. How you decide to move your arms is the output of the controller, but we'll get to that in a second. The combination of the actuators and the car dynamics is the process that we're trying to control, and is what we're calling G of S from the previous block diagram. In the feedback path, we have our sensors. In this case, as the driver, they are your sensors. It is the way that you recognize what the car is doing. Now this is mostly your eyes, but it's also things like the g-force on your body when you turn and accelerate. You use all of that to understand how the car is moving. 
Closing the loop is your brain, the controller. It is taking the input to the system, which is how you want to drive. It's recognizing what you're doing based on your sensors, and then it adjusts accordingly with your arms and legs. And now that we have our block diagram set up, we can compare this to how you would go about designing a controller, which in this case is thinking about how to drive the car, or what should your brain do. Well, there are requirements. You got into this car for a reason. And with frequency response methods, you mostly think about requirements like rise time and settle time. However, for this example, I want to be more general. Are you driving to the store? Then maybe you want to drive it leisurely with easy turns and slow acceleration. Are you driving off-road? Then maybe you want to limit your speed. Are you in a race? Then you should accelerate hard and turn hard. But knowing how you want to drive is only part of the story. You also need to know the capability of the car itself. For example, how fast can you turn the steering wheel, which is captured in the actuator block? And what is the car's ability to perform, which is captured in the car dynamics block? The combination of these two blocks give you what you and the car are capable of doing. You could jerk the wheel hard and turn the car very fast. And if you were in a race with tight turns, this might be exactly what you want to do. But you would be crazy to not take into account your own ability to see when deciding how to drive. I mean, maybe there's fog, or it's nighttime, or you forgot your glasses. All of these are reasons to not drive the car as hard as you may have wanted to. And this is what the open loop transfer function gives you. It takes into account the entire system, so you know exactly what you're dealing with. And the frequency design methods, like Nyquist and Bode and Root Locus, use the open loop transfer function to decide what your brain, I mean the controller, should do. And now that we have a better understanding of what the open loop transfer function is, Let's go back to the original question. What is the actual open loop transfer function for our system? Is it g times h, or is it g over 1 plus gh minus g? Are you ready for this? They are both correct. At least, they're both correct for their own system. You see, once we manipulated the block diagram, we can only guarantee that the closed loop system will be the same in this one instance. But we did actually change the way our vehicle and the actuator and the sensors behave. Let's see what I mean by this by drawing both block diagrams again. But this time I'll add an extra block where we would put the controller. For our starting condition, our controller is the very boring proportional controller of 1. And we've shown that these two closed loop systems are in fact the same. However, instead of a 1, if I replace our controller with a k, a gain of any value, these two systems are no longer the same which means that if we want to modify the performance of our system, that is, how we want to drive it, we would have to design two different controllers, one for each system, in order to keep these two equivalent. To show you why this is the case, let's move on to part three, where we plot the root locus for both. First things first with the root locus method is that we need to get the closed loop transfer function into a particular form, where that form is something in the numerator, which isn't terribly important right now, and 1 plus k times the open loop transfer function in the denominator. This is normally necessary because the drawing rules for the root locus were developed to work on the open loop transfer function. Arranging the closed loop transfer function in this form is a way to find that open loop system, but we already have the open loop equation since our systems are so simple, therefore we don't have any extra work to do here. Our two open loop systems are g times h, and g over 1 plus gh minus g. To plot the root locus, we'll need some actual transfer function values, so I will arbitrarily set g of s to 1 over s plus 3, and h of s to 1 over s plus 2. I just picked values that would make the math easy, but still get the point across. And there's really nothing special about these functions, they could have been anything. And it's probably worth trying this exercise with a different set of functions on your own. We'll split the screen in half and do the root locus for transfer function gh on the left and the other transfer function on the right. We'll start on the left. g times h is 1 over s plus 3 times 1 over s plus 2. There are two poles in this transfer function, one at minus 3 and one at minus 2. We'll plot those poles on the imaginary plane and draw the root locus. Now I've already done a video on how to draw a root locus, so I won't repeat it in detail here. A link is in the description below if you want a refresher. The main thing you need to remember about a root locus plot is that the lines show how the location of the closed loop poles move as you adjust the gain k. 
the lines start at the open loop poles and they travel to the open loop zeros. From this plot, we can determine the location of the closed loop poles from the open loop poles and zeros. In this case, there are no open loop zeros, so the two lines go off vertically to infinity. Depending on how we adjust k from zero to infinity, the closed loop poles will exist somewhere on this green line. So let's move to the right side. The open loop transfer function is a bit more complicated, and it requires some algebra to solve for the poles and zeros. But what we find in the end is that there is one zero at minus two, and two poles, complex conjugates of each other, at minus two plus and minus j. I'll duplicate our imaginary plane and plot the one zero and the two poles. Now I can draw the root locus for this system. In this plot, the two lines start at the open loop poles, they circle around to the left where they crash into each other on the real line, and then one pole moves towards the open loop zero, and the other heads off to the left to infinity. Now clearly both open loop systems are different, and because of that, both root locus plots are different. But if I move the left graph over to the right side and plot them on top of each other, you'll see that they overlap a little, but there are only two points where the poles can overlap at the exact same time. Now wouldn't it be great if those two points were right where k equaled 1? Well, that's easy to check by taking our closed loop transfer function and solving for the poles algebraically. Either one will do since we've already proved in part 1 that they are the same for k equals 1. And in doing so, I find that the closed loop poles are at minus 2.5 plus and minus 0.87j, right where my hand-drawn graph said they should be. So that's it. By manipulating the block diagram, we were able to create a closed loop system with unity feedback that behaved the same as the original system with non-unity feedback, but only in that exact condition. Once you start adding other blocks like a controller, they will start to deviate from each other. That means you absolutely don't want to design a controller using one system and apply that controller to another system, unless you know they have equivalent open loop transfer functions as well. It just won't work the way you're expecting. I hope this has helped clear up some confusions you might have had regarding block diagram manipulation, root locus, and open loop systems. If you have questions on this, please leave a comment and I, or maybe another viewer, will try to answer them. If you have other standard homework type questions that you think people would benefit from me making a video on it, please send those along as well. You can tweet them to me at Brian B. Douglas. Thanks for watching and engaging with me, I really enjoy hearing back from all of you and a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you would like to support me in my efforts on YouTube, you can at the Patreon link in the description below. For any amount of support, you get a digital copy of my book in progress on control theory. As always though, if you'd like a copy of the book but don't want to support me on Patreon, just send me a message and I'll email a copy to you for free. That way we can spread the knowledge and help everyone on their quest to becoming better control system engineers.